Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and we're going to be going over UFC 299 from a DFS perspective. And for those of you here for the first time, we break down the DFS uh, analysis into two distinct videos. One, which we do uh, today, where we go over the best plays, um, go over what are some good upside uh, uh, fighters to target, which are fades and things like that. And then uh, we do a betting breakdown tomorrow, which is very kind of fun and contrarian. And then probably Saturday morning, we're going to do a another DFS video where we completely focus on lineup construction. Because as you guys know uh, from watching these videos before, there's, at least in my opinion, just a huge uh, difference between the analysis of, of who the best plays are and how to actually construct lineups to win the types of GPPs that we want to win, which are the big ones. So uh, this one is obviously kind of the foundation where we, you know, break all this stuff down with the metrics and figure out who the best plays are. But then to really put it all together uh, Saturday morning, I think, or late Friday night, I'm not sure how I'm going to do it yet. We're going to use the, the, the Sims. We're going to build some lineups. We're going to build some portfolios of lineups. And hopefully that's uh going to be pretty educational for you guys. Anyway, uh, let's just get started. It's a full 14 fight card, which we can at least say this with respect to lineup construction. You don't have to worry too much about uh, ownership um, in that there's going to be a lot of guys you can choose from, a lot of girls you can choose from, and there's going to be a lot of combinations. And when I say I don't mean when I say I don't worry about ownership, what I really mean is don't worry about dupes, okay? Um, yes, there are going to be some combinations that are sort of heavily duped, but it's not as difficult to avoid them as it is usually. Uh, usually you have 11 fights, 12 at most, um, sometimes as little as 10. And in those situations, you really need to do some funny business to get unique. But uh, in a 14-fight card, it's really... Yes, I mean, you still want to get unique and you still want to go for low owned leverage and things like that. But in the end, I mean, you really want to play the best plays in, in 14 fight cards. However, the other thing that you have to keep in mind is that you really do need to put a premium on those fighters that are going to score really, really well. I mean, it's not good enough to go six for six when you have 14 fights, uh, 14 uh, uh, fights, because you're going to get you know, a, a good handful of underdogs probably winning, for example, and where, you know, on a 10, 11 fight card, if you can get six winners, including the one or two underdogs that wins, it, you really, it's not going to matter too much whether they score. But when you have all these different combinations, all these different choices of underdogs, um, you do have to prioritize upside and, and you know, what, what these guys are actually going to score when they do, in fact, uh, get lucky enough to win. So... One thing, though, is that I, I think we can try to make this 14-fight card somewhat small. When I first looked at it, I mean, there are some fights which I think are pretty fadeable, and I mean, let's get right into it. I mean, right off the bat, you have Marina Moroz versus uh, Joanne Calderwood or Joanne Wood. Whenever you have a 9K, 7,200, you know, women women MMA fight, I mean, it's just, it's very rare that those – are playable just because they don't finish all too often in, in the women's game. And sometimes you'll get, you know, somebody score really well because they have a lot of takedown upside. But aside from that, you know, these are usually fights you want to fade. And I think this is no exception. You have, I mean, look at the inside the distance line for openers. You have, I mean, Calderwood doesn't even exist here. And, and the Rose inside the distance plus 180 for a, you know, for a ninety-two hundred dollar fighter, nine thousand dollar fighter on a fourteen fight card, and that's like really asking for trouble, you know, if you play that. And you know, every once in a while, she'll put up, you know, a couple of takedown performance here. And like, if, if you get this performance from her, you know, the the against Marina Buena Silva and Maria Agapova, and you get two takedowns in seven minutes of control time and all these strikes, yeah, I mean, you can get a hundred ten point ceiling, but that's not always the case with her. Also, uh, in 150 max, maybe sprinkle just for the hell of it. But I think this fight's pretty much a fade. All right. Um, Asu Almabayev against CJ Vergara. 
and 9,500, 6,700. So before we even look at this, and you, you need you need to, to remember what, what you're looking for with these types of salaries. You know, like at 9,500, you need, you know, 120 points. And, and to get that, you're going to need a first round knockout or maybe plus <laughs> some takedowns and, and a lot of ground strikes. So 9,500 is a tough, tough price tag to get to in general. Um, something to think about before we even look at these metrics. So you have Asu on the buy of, you know, his, his win odds are great, but don't really care about that. Um, his inside the distance line is, I mean, it's just okay. I mean, minus 105. I mean, you, you need to have extreme amount of takedown upside to go with that to even be remotely playable here. And, uh, I mean, he did a good job against Odie Osborne at two takedowns. But that's what you're gonna you're gonna need. You're gonna need like perfection. So it's it's uh it's a tough spot. I I don't know if I'm gonna prioritize this. I'm certainly not gonna play them in my my big buy-ins where I'm actually just trying to get, handpick my plays. If I get to him because the Sims get me get me to him, then that's fine. But certainly a very difficult price tag to reach. And then you have C.J. Vergara. I mean, the good thing about him is that all he really needs to do is win, I think, to get on the optimal. But that's not true. I mean, at, 16, at 14 fights, you know, you're still going to need to have a, somewhat of a score here. And and what what does his win condition look like? His inside the distance line is what? Like plus 560? I mean... I mean, it's rough. You know, I will say and this is more of an ownership thing, but if it turns out that Amabaya becomes really highly owned, then you could justify maybe playing Vergara just for leverage purposes. But aside from that, I mean, looking at two fights right off the bat, which are really poor as far as um, metrics go, and probably probably passes on both, honestly. So now you get to this freaking shit show. You have... Um, uh, I forget his first name, but R. De Spain against Josh Parisian, basically a fixed fight. Uh, well, I shouldn't say a fixed fight, but you have this dude who's coming in. He's a Taekwondo medalist. He's has three fights in the UFC and every, every one of them or three fights and every one of them finishes in like five seconds. I mean, just like kills people. He's huge. He's enormous. And, and, you know, they're throwing him Josh Parisian, who's just, you know, literally the bottom of the barrel in the UFC. So, they're telling him, listen, you're in, under contract. This is who you're fighting. And they're really throwing him to the wolves here. Um, and, and and his price tag is actually a very reasonable 9,300, you know, um, because you look at his inside the distance line, like forget his win odds for a second, okay? He is minus 300 inside the distance. And, and given his recent, you know, run, I would imagine that he's probably even money in the first round. So you get even money in the first round and, and you have quick win bonus. I mean, this is, this could be 130 points pretty easily. So it's a, it's, it's, listen, it's always dangerous to, to fight a guy you've never seen before. and doesn't really have a lot of experience, but I mean, these metrics are really, really strong. Um, so he's, at 9,300, he's kind of a bargain, actually, if things go the way the numbers expect. But, but, um, Josh Parisian is only plus 270. In other words, he is, um, he's going to win the fight, according to the metrics here, about 25% of the time. Uh, first of all, not that this is the end of the story, but he's not going to be 25% owned. It's going to be lower, much lower owned than that. Second of all, because of Rob Robles's you know, metrics, he's going to be probably the most popular non-main event fighter. Um, so you're going to get all kinds of leverage with Parisian. And, and if, you, if that wasn't enough, Parisian's inside the distance line is, is almost the same as his win odds here. And it's like plus 300. So if, if you were worried about what happens when he wins, which I really was at at first, you know, because I think that if I think Parisian does have paths to victory that involve boring heavyweight fights, 
Um, but even still, the combination of the leverage plus the, 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 w the win condition and the win odds and all this stuff, I, I think that you have to play Parisian on the other side as well. So while the first two fights, you could probably full fade, I think you have to play both sides of this one. Okay, Michel Perea versus Michael Olegzacek. This is a good fight, but I don't know how much fantasy upside there is. I mean, that's, that's, that's something you're going to see on these kind of like premium cards. You'll get like great fights, but you don't, they're not always as fantasy friendly as you would like. Um, so let me, uh, let's, let's take a look at it. You have, let's see. First of all, let's look at the odds. M minus 140 versus plus 120. Let's make sure there's no win odds issue here. Mm, as a matter of fact, and pay at 8,700. I mean, you do have a little bit of line value in Oleg Zaychuk here, you know? I mean, he's only a plus 120 or so underdog, and he's 7,500, so that's pretty good. But money line is not going to be enough on this card to, to justify playing him. So we have to look a little bit deeper. Well, Pahey inside the distance, plus 130 at 8,700, that's actually not bad. So he's sort of playable. And actually, Oleg Zaychuk, plus 225 at 7,500 is pretty good. So this is, a, this is sort of sneaky. I think this fight is, 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 uh, is definitely on the list of kind of priority fights here. Um, now, again, there are 14 fights, so we, we might end up, you know, getting getting better options. But um, it's, I definitely like both sides of this. Sorry about that. I had to take something. I probably stopped in the middle of the sentence. But anyway, uh, Pejea, Oze, Chuck, I do think is definitely on my list. Uh, Philippe Lins versus Ian Kutalaba, uh, 8,400 against 7,800. Let's first make sure there's no money line issues here. Um, Kutalaba minus 120. It's about, it's about right. Um, it seems good. And for these, for this type of price, you know, the 80, you know, 8,400, 7,800, you don't need that big of a, an inside the distance line to make it work. Um, usually maybe you need about plus 200 on either side. Let's take a look and see what we have here. Um, we don't really have the props yet, but you look at the over under and the over under it's juiced really to the under at one and a half rounds and, and the fight to end is minus five fifty. So this is, this is probably, and this is going to be an elite fight. Honestly, I think either of these guys are going to be probably plus plus one sixty inside the distance, if not better. Um, plus, you know, at least the Kutalaba side, Pretty sure that he has some takedown upside as well. So, yeah, eight takedown here, for example. So this is this fight is probably a must play. Um, I think both sides of this are, are, are in play. Uh, Lin certainly has finishes as well, um, and he has a fight where he has four takedowns also. So um, this is a this is a pretty key fight, and in an attempt again to make a a a small a big slate small you know let's remember what we're doing here so we're not playing morose wood not playing amabaya we're definitely going to play somebody from this fight probably going to play someone from this fight definitely going to play someone from this fight. all right kyler phillips versus pedro munoz 9100 versus 7100 so again we have to be careful we have to make sure that before we go thinking about playing these 9100 hour fighters that they either have an inside the distance line of about, you know, probably minus 110 or a significant amount of takedown upside. And from what I remember, and we'll look at this, you know, Kyler Phillips does have the takedowns. Um, that's, that's the one thing. But when you look at this, I mean, even these fights where he gets these multiple takedowns, he's not really racking up a lot of points, you know? 98 is okay. 99 is okay. Against Sonia Dog, wow, that's a good win, huh? Uh, 73 points in a win with three takedowns. So, unless you're going to get a finish, which he doesn't really get all too often, this is probably a probably a second tier play at best. 
Munoz on the other side at 7,100. Let's take a look at his metrics here. Uh, inside the distance, plus 500. So this is this is not going to work. So I think that this fight is probably close to a fade as well. Mateus Gamrod versus Rafael Dos Anjos. This is a this is a real tricky one. So you have 9,400 against 6,800. So remember what you need for a 9,400 dollar fighter. He's got to either have like first round finishing upside, probably minus one, pro almost probably even money to finish in the first round or, and, or probably, and uh, some takedown upside. And the problem here is this, right? we'll look at Gamrot. We'll look for Well, first let's look at this inside the distance. I imagine it's minus 110, but let's just take a look. Actually, I don't even think it would. It is. I think it's going to be less. So Gamrot inside the distance is, yeah, he's plus 250. And this is terrible. So the, the thing is, is that, for him to be a good play, he's got to get there on these takedowns. And this goes two ways. The first thing is, yeah, great. He gets a bunch of takedowns, you know, four takedowns, four takedowns, six takedowns, four takedowns. I mean, he gets takedowns. However, like his opponent, Rafael Dos Anjos, is a pretty damn good wrestler in his own right. I mean, he gets multiple takedowns as well. So I don't know if, if, if Gamrot is going to have as much of an edge in the wrestling as is going to be needed to get fantasy points via that method. As a matter of fact, I mean, I'm not a, a trainer, but if I were, I'd probably just advise Gamrot to stay on the feet and just kind of just beat him up striking, which he probably could. So uh, I don't like it. <laughs> um, as a matter of fact, I, I kind of want to say that, that, Dos Anjos is not the worst underdog in the world because, because if in fact he does win, it's going to be because he's the one that was getting the takedowns. Okay. Can he win like that? I don't know, but I promise you that if he does win, it's going to be because of the takedowns and that's going to score well. So I think if any of these fighters and this is going to be in play, it's going to be Dos Anjos. I mean, his issue is he just doesn't win a lot. I mean, he's plus, you know, 355 or so. So he's only going to win like 20% of the time. But I think in the fights that he wins, he scores really well. So uh, I'm going to put him as kind of another kind of cheap punt. Him and uh, what's his name? And Parisian. Caitlin Chikagian versus Macy Barber. Um, all right, let's take a look at the price here. Macy Barber is 8,800. So at 8,800, remember, we're looking for an inside the distance line of about plus 100 or so, maybe plus 110. And in the absence of that, a lot of takedown upside. And, and Macy Barber, despite the fact that she, you know, is pretty violent for a, for a female wrestler or for a female fighter, her inside the distance line is really not great. I mean, it's, it's plus, it's really actually pretty poor. It's plus 300. So this is a pretty stone cold fade as far as I'm concerned, um, and Chukagian, no, nothing special on the other side either. So I think this fight is probably the fade. All right, uh, Jail Tan Al Almeida versus uh, Curtis Blades. I, I don't think we're supposed to overthink this one, but we'll we'll look at it. Uh, Eighty two hundred eight k, and when you have this this type of pricing, it's already usually a decent play to play that fight. But then when you also have a fight like this with, with both fighters with a lot of upside, um, it's, it's a very, very difficult thing. Like, well, let's look at, first of all, we'll look at the inside the distance line first, which probably isn't going to be that great, at least for Jolton Almeida. So Almeida's inside the distance line is plus, it's actually not bad, plus 200. I mean, if you knew nothing else and you saw it was an $8,100 fighter plus 200, you'd take it. And Blades on the other side is plus 160. So without even knowing anything else, you probably want to play both sides of this. But you factor in also the fact that both fighters have takedown upside. Um, I mean, you just can't avoid this, I don't think. I mean, the only reason you could avoid it or might avoid it is because there are 14 fights and for ownership purposes and things like that. But as far as figuring out, like, you know, like the best plays, um, you know, this is, I mean, this is, this is extremely strong. Let's put it back. 
let's see. So let's 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 remind us where we are right now. Okay, so we we like to play somebody from the the Parisian fight. We want to play maybe somebody from the Jose Chuck fight. Definitely want to play someone from the Kudalaba fight. And then definitely want to play someone from the Almeida fight. Okay. So you can see where these, and, and I'm not saying that other people aren't going to do this. And that's actually a good point is that, you know, this is going to be the chalky build, I imagine, because this just makes so much sense. And then that's when you have to get into, you know, ownership fades and using the Sims and stuff like that, which we'll get to in the construction video. But these are the best plays. I don't think it's, up for, up for debate. I mean, who's going to debate me that the Almeida Blades and the Kudalaba Lins fights and, and even this the Spain fight, how are these three fights before we get to the main event? You know, and we'll get to that in a minute, two main events. How are these not the best the best plays? They just are. I mean, by the by via the math, they just are. Um, okay. Sonia Dong versus Piotr Yan. Great fight, really close fight. Very, you know, well lined fight, you know, 8,300, 7,900, and, and Jan is minus 120. Uh, inside the distance line is awful. I mean, this fight is, is minus 200 to, to go the distance, and neither fighter has an inside the distance line that you want to play, and neither of them have that great takedown upside. So, this fight is a good fight to watch but probably a very poor fight to play in DFS. So this one's probably going to be a fade. Now we're at the three, three big kahunas. And then the four, we have the four big kahunas left. Um, uh, first, we have um, Jack Della Maddalena versus Gilbert Burns. And this is, you know, a very obvious clash of styles here. You have Jack Della Maddalena, who is a pure striker, um, really, really talented boxer, who's, Takedown defense has been kind of tested, um, to say the least. And you have Gilbert Burns, who is a jujitsu guy, whose striking is okay, but he gets a lot of lot of action out of his jujitsu and takedowns and things like that. So, um, first, let's look at the price. So, eighty six hundred versus seventy six hundred, and the line is about right, but. Take a look at the inside the distance line here. So Jack Maddalena, he is inside is plus 140 or plus 150. And that's actually pretty, I mean, that's reasonable at 8,600, but it's not great. I mean, I would really put him as a fringy, I mean, it's, it's a much worse play than Ian Kutalaba, for example. So I think he's fine. And as you get into 20 max, you know, and up, you could definitely use him more, but he's certainly not as good as the, um, as the, whatchamacallit play, as the, uh, um, what am I saying? The uh, Kudalaba play, for example. Well, let's, before we forget, let's, let's see, how does he compare to Oleg Zaychuk, um, that fight, just for, for a second. Maybe I overestimated how good the Oleg Zaychuk the correct Pahaya side was now Pahaya the inside is plus 130. I mean, that's that's he's plus 130. I guess Madalena is actually just about as good, right? He's crap. plus 150. So I guess he is very similar to the Alex A. Chuck Pahaya. So yeah, so either the Pahaya side is not as good as I thought, or the Delamada De Della. De Madalena side is better than I thought. So I think the two of them are probably equal. Um, Gilbert Burns on the other side of this is a pretty elite play because if in fact he wins, it's going to be because he gets these takedowns and, and that's going to score really, really well. Because even I, I don't even care really about his inside the distance line here. Um, but even still, I mean, his inside the distance line, let's take a look at it. It's plus two thirds. That's not the end of the world either. So, um, yeah, so I think this fight is actually very similar to the Oleg Zaychuk fight. So I would prioritize both those very similarly. Michael Page versus Kevin Holland. Kevin Holland minus 132 plus 112. Let's take a look at the prices. Um, Holland 8,500. Yeah, maybe a little bit of line value in Page at 77. But, you know. 
uh, not that big a deal. As far as the inside the distance line here, page inside the distance doesn't even exist. Like plus 600. And, and Holland inside is, is better. I mean, he's like plus 230. At his price, that's, but that's not as good as Della Maddalena or, or even Correa. The only thing that might improve Holland's metrics here is the fact that he might have some takedown upside. But as we've seen, I mean, he doesn't, I mean, he prefers to strike. He just does. So I think this is going to be just kind of a competitive striking battle, which is just not going to score very well. So I think that this fight's probably a pass. Okay, so now we're at the two main events, two five-round fights. Uh, and I do believe that these fights are very difficult to fade. Um, you have four fighters here who can work well. Who, well, let's just say this. Given the fact that it's five rounds, you have four fighters that can really benefit from that. Um, and I think that whoever wins... I think both these fights is going to be is going to score pretty well, but I believe that this first fight here is the one that you really need to prioritize more. Um, the Saint Denis Poirier fight, um, you know, this this is this fight is either going to finish or going to be a five round war with a lot of stuff going on, a lot of takedowns, a lot of reversals, a lot of a lot of strikes. Just a very fantasy friendly fight. Ooh, that little alliteration there, fantasy friendly fight. So you got to play both of these dudes. You just have to. I mean, they both have strong inside the distance lines, I imagine, without even looking. Have Santony minus 130 inside, even Poirier plus 220 inside. Plus, there's all kinds of. of of miscellaneous nonsense. When I say nonsense, takedowns, controls, five rounds. I mean, this is a tough fight to fade. So both these guys. O'Malley Vera might be a little bit easier to fade, although it's hard to fade. <laughs> um, just because like Vera is sort of low volume. So it's possible that if this fight plays out the way most Vera fights play out that he does well in, you know, he gets off to a kind of a slow start, but he's durable enough. And then he kind of just comes on late. Then you end up with a five-round striking battle, which may score well enough. For We're talking about Maui first, but may not. Uh, in addition to that, if you get no Maui second or third round KO, that may score well enough for O'Malley, but might not. I think the Vera side is gonna is going to score well regardless, just because of his price. I mean, he's seven K or whatever. So if in fact he does win, I think five rounds of, of striking is going to be enough for him to get there. So, um, but I mean, you think about this. I mean, who? I'll ask you this: Who is most likely to get a hundred points in a win? Marlon Vera or um, Josh Parisi? Actually, I wouldn't necessarily say Josh Breeze because he could win a, a gross decision. Who's who's more likely to score, score 100 points in a win, Marlon Vera or Rafael Dos Anjos? Um, I guess Vera, but not always. I don't know. So uh, I think that as I talk through this, I think if I, I'm going to fade one of these fights, it's going to be the main. I'm not. I'm not getting in the way of this. Thing. Uh, this is way too, way too much action. Way too volatile. Way too much m m many events for me to fade this one. But the O'Malley Vera fight. I mean, you get the Vera fight that that you expect. Slow start, come on late. You can get a five round decision, and then you're obviously rooting for the O'Malley decision, <laughs> right? Because if Vera wins a decision, you know, if you faded it, you you still might lose because Vera can get there. But if O'Malley wins the decision, you know, he could get 100, but maybe not. Okay, uh, that's going to do it. Uh, we're going to do a betting breakdown tomorrow, and then we're going to do a lineup construction video probably later tomorrow or Saturday morning. Good luck, everybody.